been following along already, you know that I am Ani Baker and I was a public school teacher and now I'm a documentary filmmaker and I started this series from quarantine this year after about two months of crying when I became really, really fascinated that the huge events of 2020 were creating immediate global impact from a single source. That's just still so wild to me. So I've turned these conversations I've had with people into mini documentaries for you, kind of, uh, about the life-altering events of 2020 in countries all over the world. And in episode five, we're off to Lisbon, Portugal. Now, Lisbon is the capital of Portugal, which means it relies heavily on tourism, which is not allowed right now. So they've really taken a huge economic hit. We're gonna speak to Diogo Marquez about what Lisbon has been like this year. A little bit about Portugal's history and the Carnation Revolution, which is the coolest name for a military coup ever. And we talk to each other about ways that we are mentally and emotionally coping with the world right now. I hope you enjoy episode five of Around the World in 2020, Lisbon, Portugal. When did lockdown start for you in Lisbon? It must have been like third week of March because I had just come back from a trip to London and it, like at the end of February, like early March. And the weird part was back then COVID was just this abstract thing that wasn't really affecting anyone. Like you saw some mask at the airport, but that was it. And like the meme started rolling by and that was the extent of like how real it felt. Like it was just this, this outside thing. But then we came back and it must've been like a week after that like cafe started closing and people started staying home from work and all that. And it felt like it just, everyone just hit pause on living for a bit. The whole like being on a trip and coming home to lockdown is so wild. I don't know if you read the story about Jared Leto, but he like went no, on a yeah, silent yes. retreat. Can you imagine coming home from a silent retreat? Oh where, like You're renewed and you see the world through a new yeah. lens and then it's a ghost. I just can't imagine that would be so eerie. So what did lockdown look like in Lisbon? It, it was pretty aggressive. Um, I feel, especially compared to the states where it's more like case by case basis or New York was hit and I think Washington was hit as well. Mm -hmm. And But like you had like a more seg like segmented picture. Over here it was pretty much like we started having cases at first in the northern part of the country, whereas Lisbon is like center. And so even then it was kind of this far away thing, oh, it's happening over there. Like it was happening in Spain as well and it was happening up there. Like it wasn't in Lisbon for like at least a week. Right. But then once it started hitting like everything closed at once. It was like an overnight switch where like every coffee shop was closed, like supermarkets were like super strict. They had like um, in the mornings for like senior citizens and older people, like people at risk to go. And then even after that, it was like super strict hours. Like everything was sort of super regimented and it was super bizarre. Like, cause it was so quick. Like it was a night and day switch. Whereas I felt in other places it was a bit more gradual. But I think yeah. here it was like super, super, like you could draw a line in the day when it happened, basically. Interesting. For your community, the, the people that you interact with in Lisbon, how are you guys handling it when it first went down? And how are you talking about it? How are you feeling overall? I think at first everyone was like super paranoid in the sense of like checking the data like every day. And, and that's all everyone could talk about. It was, it was like this zeitgeist sort of to the extreme, right? where every conversation you had either began or ended with like lockdown, like statistics and like cases and number of deaths and stuff like that. Yeah. And that was super stressful. Like it was, it basically felt like you couldn't talk, like nothing else was worth talking about. And it, it was super strange. After a while, you just got exhausted the thinking and talking about it. So I think early on, there was a lot of that. But gradually, I think it became, as it became routine, as it became the new normal, it, it kind of moved to like, talking about, you know, regular, more lighthearted stuff again. And I think lately, especially, uh, like lockdown eased a little bit and we started, you know, hanging out in small groups and, and sort of trying to do things like we used to, to an extent while still being safe. Uh, so tell me a little bit about what is it like there now? Tell me about the cases and if you know anybody personally who has contracted COVID. So over here, I think we, in terms of case numbers, I think we there's been this thing in Europe as a whole where like case reporting has been a little bit shoddy in the sense of they're just not reporting many cases. Okay. Um, in, in most countries, uh, it's sort of giving the impression that it's sort of that we're past it now. Uh, but in Portugal, it, we've actually been quite aggressive with testing. I think I think we're still like amongst the highest. So 
we've had that had the unintended consequence of like we're travel banned from a bunch of places when those places start reopening you know august or, or soon but over here in terms of number of cases like i mean compared to like the big hot spots in the us it's absolutely nothing right right and, and that's the thing that always alarms me especially talking to friends in the us where it's like it just feels so nothing here like i i personally don't know anyone who is i like indirectly i do like uh friend of a friend sort of thing sure. it doesn't feel like it's like it's right next door and imminently about to happen right it feels like still feels like a bit more distant but then uh you read about the us or you read about the uk and it's like absolutely insanity where it's like they're reopening recklessly and stuff like that and over here we did reopen a bit too soon and i not basically reopen almost completely and then we this week started shutting some stuff down like limiting opening hours and stuff like that but you can still just go out and go to you know wherever because in terms of numbers i have this problem where i don't really sometimes don't keep up with portuguese media it's mostly like american centric content that i'm consuming i've heard a yeah. lot of that. i've heard a lot of that people from various countries that i've spoken to so far are like this kind of woke us up to okay we see what's going on in the us but what about what's going on right here portugal is basically one generation cycle behind the rest of the world in terms of like uh, which generation was the first to go to college for example mm. because we had a dictatorship up till the 70s so that population group is so uneducated you know like 90% uh un- illiterate something like that at the wow. time so that sort of set us back to an extent where now we're dealing with like issues of literacy and issues of education there's also a problem in terms of uh like political parties being treated as football teams similar to the US in that sense Mm-hmm. where like the the big parties are very much like they're going to get a tattoo on their chest and they're going to vote that way till they die so it's not really going to change mm-hmm. and so and that's been a problem for sure and there's been a few sort of grassroots parties emerging but even those have had really pro- like problematic leaders or like members of parliament so it set the whole movement back like a lot as well so in your social circle who do you guys turn to which leader do you turn to for information specifically about covid what is that leader telling you guys how are you feeling about the leadership as it comes to or as it pertains to covid-19 mm. so uh over here it's in mainly the dgs which would be i don't remember the acronym in the us but it's basically the general health department of the government okay and they've been doing a a fairly good job you have a website a dedicated website just go there and you got all the statistics you got like safety measures and it's fairly well updated they post on twitter every single day stuff like that so i think it's been in terms of direct statistics it's been a lot of that in terms of like journalism and sort of second hand stuff uh, i think different outlets have been doing different things like uh, i think one like the big newspapers are sort of doing it responsibly to an extent but then you got cntv which would be the fox news here sort of just saying the dumbest things you could possibly say and they hit a lot of the population i think probably the same proportion as Fox News where it's like they're very influent they're like the best influencer in terms of if you would compare it to like Instagram mm. uh, where it's like they are super like they penetrate their audience super deeply in they basically been doing the and like the contrary to what most other outlets have been doing in where they're pushing this myth of like it, we should take care of the economy you know not take care of the people that sort of dichotomy where they've been saying like we got to get back to our jobs because this economy is going to crash you know and there's a lot of tourism here so they've been saying oh this is killing our tourism that that has been a big battle especially in lisbon with like airbnb on every street and like mm. so many tourism dedicated businesses right to an extent that like it dominated the, the cities and to an extent the country's economy for the past like five years absolutely so. yeah so so we have the cdc the center for disease control yeah. where we go for most of our info but then like Trump defunded the World Health Organization when he was elected. He disbanded the pandemic response. Yes. Sir. And uh, that. so we've had a lot of direct hits from him against I don't know, progress, protection, safety, public health. Do you have anything like that where like you have people in charge being like, I'm going to actually make this a lot harder for you guys. Watch. Any equivalent to You haven't yet. Um uh... Because also I feel like though like those groups aren't in a position of power to that extent like you know, I'm not president or or anything to, right. like even close 
So thankfully, I think we've had like the message from the government has been fairly uniform in the sense of let's take as many precautions as we can and sort of keep it safe. Uh, whereas obviously in the US, you, you had Trump literally like going against his own experts. Uh, yeah, that, that wasn't really happening here, thankfully. And and I think that that unity from government, there, there's, a, there's a strong anti-government sentiment here where like government is all corrupt and thieves and stuff like that. And, and I think that unity from the government has also created some pushback from that anti-government sentiment where it's like, oh, they're just, they're just doing this to control us or whatever. But in a different sense than in the US, where in the US it's mostly about personal freedom and, and the, the strong ideals that, right. that come along with that. Over here, it's been mostly a thing of finding the government utterly corrupt and going against whatever they said, no matter what it was. If the government said to not wear masks, the people would wear masks. Like it literally feels like that sometimes. I'm curious about, and I know, you know, it, it was strongest in the US, but riots and protests broke out all over the place, all over the world. What was it like in Portugal? How did that conversation first reach you? What did it feel like? How did you engage with it? It, it like, it hit here in a, I think a particular way because like we have a very a problematic and very strange history with racism being a former colonial empire. And so I think we've had like troubled like race relations, I guess for the long forever basically right it's a core part of our country just similar to the us in that sense but less so because it's slave owning but more because we kind of made this happen we mm -hmm. were one of the first ones to go to africa you know along with the uk and spain and it was like this is like the world is like this partly because of what of what this country did and over here it was like the first i heard of it was on i guess by philip defranco show on youtube and it was like you know another news story in the sense of like, it's terrible, but it's sort of, I think it, we like, especially here, we hear it so often from the US of like, whether it's a school shooting or something tragic happening, that it just kind of, and police brutality comes comes up a lot. So it was just like, oh, it's another case that was absolutely terrible, but I didn't think it was gonna be extraordinary like it was. And and then the movement started picking up and for a long time it was, oh, that's a, that's an American thing. like. That, that's them, like we don't really have, like that was the core message here and the core feeling here. And the reporting was very distant. It was always like over there for, for a bit. But then I think, especially in like people my age, like it was definitely a young movement here, the really young movement where we started like, no, 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 like this is happening here. Like earlier this year, a woman got beaten like uh, late night here in like the party district in Lisbon because, for no reason at all. Like, and this happened and it was, kind of viral for like two days, you know, and it died because people are so empathetic here. Was it a racist uh, beating? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like it, the, like, it was like so almost cartoonishly racist. It was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And and the that video circulated for a bit, but it, it sort of died down. And, and then it, the movement started picking up here with like English language and American sort of themes and like the, the the same posts being reshared and stuff like that which was definitely positive and but then there came an opposite movement where it was like oh we like you only care because the americans are doing it you think it's trendy mm. right because we have this sort of complex of like especially among youth culture that older people view as insincere where it's like oh you use all these english like things you appropriate all this like anglo-saxon culture like it's not authentic you know what i mean so there's so much of that. And, you know, for a long time, I felt that about myself, whereas like I was mostly engaging with, with American culture and, and that sort of coming to a head. But generally, I think the movement here was very positive. Like there was no, not even close to a riot, right? It was very like the police were kind of just closing down streets, basically, just making sure there are no cars going by. That was the extent of their activity, at least in the center of town, because in what we've since found out is that Lisbon is very, very segregated. There's a huge level of segregation geographically in Lisbon. Like it's absolutely insane because of all the people coming from the colonies in the seventies after what we had our colonial war, where they sort of created those outskirts, you know, that weren't there in the seventies. So those communities are so young that that segregation is based, like it's still here, you know, all those years later. Right. And because of that, a lot of videos started showing up of like police interactions and altercations from those neighborhoods. And, and sort of showing, look, it was like, it was all like hippie and stuff in the center of town, but it got kind of real over there. 
you know, and you kind of have to like check your perspective a bit and making sure that like, especially my perspective, like living in downtown a nice place isn't representative in the slightest. So I think there was a lot of growth on that part for me and for a lot of like, I guess, privileged young people of like, we aren't representative at all. Like it felt like we were doing it better than the US, but we just weren't looking at the right places. And I think that was a lot of important growth in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the specific type of racism that Portugal or specifically Lisbon deals with. Is it more xenophobia? Is Does the racism mirror at all what we deal with here? So here it's, a, it, it, it's, it's definitely a different, a different tone than it is in the US. It's a, it's a lot more overt, I feel. Uh, whereas like, I remember in my, I, let's say I was like six years old. Uh, I'm 20, I'm 22 now. And uh, my grandmother, um, and being with my grandmother in the supermarket, right? And he overhearing like another woman with her kid, like, oh, don't touch that fruit. The black guy touched that fruit. Wow. Yeah. And this wasn't, this was like six, 17 years ago, maybe. It's like, it wasn't that long ago. Because of that, we had an influx of people from Angola, from Mozambique, from like all the colonies in this, like in 1974, right? That was so like, that was so recent that I think our racism is, is also so recent. Like a lot of people, a lot of older people, especially felt it, felt invaded, you know? Like that's, that's kind of the perspective. It's, it's always of like, oh, they come here, they take our jobs, they like take our city. So there's a lot of that. And there was actually a great post about on Instagram that was basically like everyday racism I was like, you don't even feel like you're, you're being racist. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of sentences like, oh, you're pretty for a black girl or, yeah. oh, your hair isn't like black hair or right. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's stuff that I heard in middle school, you know, even in high school. And that wasn't that long ago. And so I think it, that's what I mean when I think it, it feels more overt mm -hmm. is that because our barrier was so recent that like, especially with, with dealing with black racism, that it was like, a generation like it was two generations ago maybe mm -hmm. and because of that i think it sort of set everything back and it's so much more overt and it's so much more gross in that sense where a lot of people still feel like they can be absolutely racist on the street and like it doesn't matter right because they think they're validated in a community of like-minded people and it takes a lot of effort from i think a lot of the media and a lot of younger people to be like that's not cool like that's not a thing we should do so it's, it's, younger been, it's, been, people, though, yeah. it's younger people leading the charge that's true across the world and and it's incredible and i think it's the way that we connect to each other and share information on social media that makes us so aware of the daily existence of another person that we maybe even typically wouldn't have a window into their lives for me consume mostly english media the response is, has been fairly negative for a long time and now seeing it for me become this more positive thing where, where social media can take a very positive role it can be legitimately useful like no other tool has been before and over here it just feel, like it feels like young people are taking advantage of it but it feels like so like so many older people are still completely disconnected because they're in their facebook bubble you know and that, that sort of what they're dealing with, it feels like it doesn't hit them, you know? Like it feels like it's almost this underground network that has an age limit or something. Mm. Uh, mm. So which, which is kind of strange. It's been really interesting to hear countries all over the world talk to me about the type of racism that they deal with and xenophobia has come up a lot. This this movement right now, the Black Lives Matter movement has, has shown a light on racism specifically. Right now in America, just like you just said, look, we are, as a population, and I hate to use the word we, but I'm going to, we're racist against everyone, you know? And right now we're dealing with the racism against black people, which is systemic and the most horrid here. What type of racism do you think is being illuminated right now in Portugal? And what is being done? What's the conversation about? Is there a conversation in Portugal about like, hey guys, we've got to do better. This can't happen anymore. Or has that type of energy made its way to you? It, there is, there was to, I think there was to an extent. I think it mostly died down sadly. Like it, at least it feels like it in terms of the zeitgeist, it feels like it's died considerably. But like, like I said, like recently it's been mostly about the racism against, against black people. And because of the sheer volume here, like that has also taken the spotlight. But I think there has been a conversation amongst young people in terms of dealing with the general xenophobia that is here. 
that is that mostly doesn't care who it's judging it's just judging everyone that's not us and yeah it's like i haven't seen that much conversation around fixing that which which is something that especially in this part of town with so many businesses you can feel every, like on every street you got like a, a store run by an indian family or you got like you know whatever it might be a like convenience store or like whatever it might be and you run into and they're the nicest people you know they're just like they're part of the community they're, they're just doing their living their life and they're really helpful and i wonder if because it pales in comparison to what you are witnessing that's going on over here do you think there's a little bit of okay good at least we're not that bad guys were fine yeah absolutely that's a big sentiment here in general in regards to politics in regards to healthcare in regards to basically any situation it's always oh at least we're not that bad like don't worry about it and yes it's like it's good to realize that we're doing something right but at the same time like our healthcare is super underfunded and has a ton of problems like and it's we have an nhs similar to to the uk and like the uk it's super underfunded and there are like people in government trying to like privatize it and we're all like no 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 no, no. look can you see what's happening over there like this is not a thing we want Right, especially with the population this aging, this poor, like yeah. that, you don't want to like put them through the the insurance system. Trust me. So beyond the video that you referenced of police brutality against a black woman, is there a big problem with police brutality specifically against the black population in Portugal? Generally, I would say I'd say there there is a problem for sure, and I think it goes under documented. Uh, like it like it shows up from time to time but it's not like we don't get the big media splashes of like maybe it shows up on the news and it just kind of goes away the population here is very it's, there's a strong sense of apathy towards government towards elections towards like basically any form of engagement of like communal engagement and that transcend like that affects the 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 reach and the importance that these events are given because like it's not the first time a video like that showed up this one just happened to coincide because this was like in february so the video happened it died and then it resurfaced on social media because of the movement right so like that that says it all like when it happened here and it was a national issue nobody really cared like and then it took an internet like it took an american-led movement and it took a sort of oh now it's like meaningful because like celebrities are talking about it that's genuinely what it feels like sometimes in Lisbon, in Portugal, what do you see as being aspects of your daily reality that will always be impacted by what has gone on this year? What do you think the lasting changes will be for you there? It feels like it's not like it, at the moment, it feels like people are going to have to change their minds about what normal is and about what, like how to sort of live in the com like in the communal spaces and, and sort of how to engage in that with that because like not just in terms of like pure hygiene but also in terms of like being a bit more mindful of others right that's where the mask comes in and that's where a lot of people are almost selfish with the mask where it's like they, they just I don't know use it or like just can't use it because they're sort of told to use it so like sometimes you see people driving in their car with their masks on with like windows closed and you're just like you're just using it because I mean, better off than not using it, but you're just using it because someone told you to, you know? Where it, it feels like it's like that sometimes, where it's very much just following a rule because. And and I think that would, like, I think that would have to change to be a bit more conscious. And I think we lack a lot of that consciousness, especially with, with regards to others and feeling a bit more empathetic and being able to sort of safeguard others in the way that, you know, people do in Japan with wearing their mask when they're sick. Like, that, that feeling of sort of, putting away some out of some of our individualism that we've you know that we've grown over the years and sort of gaining back some collectivism and being like okay we gotta like take things a bit more mindfully at the same time while like that's what i hope and that's what i see in certain pockets generally the message is still very apathetic very much like we don't care yeah so i'm i am hoping for it and i see shreds of it but i don't know if it's going to change like across the entire like society so, right. Yeah. Have you had a, a low point? What What did your lowest point look like? What were your thoughts around that? What did it feel like? To be honest, like I was probably struggling before this, like because mm -hmm. just directionlessness and just overall like having to go to therapy and figure things out. Yeah. And sort of 
putting my stubbornness aside and, and sort of being able to be vulnerable and accept help. But this just kind of felt like it put everything on pause and I didn't know how to deal with that, right? I just felt time going by and especially like I noticed, oh, it's June and I had plans that I made in February, you know, that I was going to like sort things out or like be a better person by then. And I was sort of setting all these deadlines yeah. and now I'm looking at, oh, no, none of that happened. Like in this realization of like, we hit pause, but the time kept going and that I'm someone who like kind of freaks out about time a lot. Mm -hmm. So this definitely didn't help with that and brought back a, a lot of that. So that's been mainly my, my struggle is being like, okay, like I gotta make my time useful, but also not like sort of beat myself up over just being able to live for a bit. Yeah, same. Well, you're absolutely not alone. Everyone I've spoken to has a version of that. So I just want to encourage you and also remind you, this is all circumstantial, it's situational and like the ways that we feel, the disappointment that we feel in ourselves for not doing better at this time is shared. And also is just, we try to blame ourselves. Like you were saying, oh, I should have been at, you know, at this place by June. I just, I, I just want to tell you, you're absolutely not alone in that. And none of this is your fault. I know you know that, but I'm just reminding you. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's always good to hear. Like, it, it, it really is. It, sometimes it feels like it, you're this special snowflake. It's like, okay, may, maybe this is shared. Like, maybe it's, you gotta understand that in the good, that in a good, like, sense, you're not that special. And this is something yeah. that, that, that people understand and other people, like, feel. And at that time, that's, like, super useful. And then my last question for you, what do you think has been, for you personally, the gift? What has been a gift that you feel like you have gained from this unprecedented year? I think mainly, like it's been, it's been sort of being engaged in a few more groups than I was before. Cause like I'm someone who doesn't have a lot of friends. Like I have a few strong friendships and being able to find some online groups and just talk about video games or whatever it may be like that. That's been fun and, and part of being at home and, but still finding connections, like watching Twitch streams, right? Which I couldn't really do because of the time difference where it, like, it was just too late. Now I can just kind of stay up a bit and watch those and interact with more people. Yeah. Like that has been pretty positive. And, and more than anything, that has gotten me to actually do some some stuff of my own or like setting up my website or, you know, whatever, maybe write some stuff. And, and that has been something that I was really needing, I think. And I think it took some external push, but like seeing other people do cool stuff and being inspired by that. That's beautiful. I love that things have emerged for you. It took me, oh, I feel like it took like a couple months before, before I felt like I was even in an emotional or mental space to go, okay, I'm gonna make the best of this. It sounds like you feel safe, yeah? Yeah, I would agree with that. Like even like, even not, not just by compare, like by comparison, I feel a lot safer, right? Uh, but even just here, like anecdotally through what I see on the street and stuff, like I feel generally, I, I feel pretty, pretty safe even go, you know, going out to get some coffee or whatever it might be like, it's not normal yet, but it feels, it feels fine. And it, it didn't feel fine for a long time. So that's been like over the past, like maybe three weeks or so. That's been pretty nice. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this. Your perspective has been illuminating. It's very, very important. Thank you. Stay safe. Keep upbeat. Tell your mom hi for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds we'll lovely. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing it together. I really like it. It's been it's been fun, and I can't wait to see the the other sort of sides of the of the interview. Right. I think it's gonna be really fascinating to to get those perspectives. And like, I think all your projects are like really, really like meaningful. If that makes sense. Like, I think you're. I think you're something I've like. I think you're a really good follow in that sense because you're always striking to do to have meaningful conversations. Oh. Like, okay. yeah. I, 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 I love that, that, you know, anything I say resonates with you. That means the world to me. So thank you. All right. We'll be in touch. Have a good rest of your day. All right. You too. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye.